is a, a week where we are trying to lift up and amplify the many examples of Carolina's engagement with communities across North Carolina. And the Thorpe Faculty Engaged Scholars Program is an exciting opportunity to do this because it is about lifting up many examples of engagement across North Carolina and beyond um, year after year. And when we counted everything up, it was at the 15 year point. And so um, just wanted to welcome y'all to Engagement Week and encourage you to register for other activities throughout this week. Um, some of which are in person, some are hybrid and some are virtual. And there's also some content on the website. So now I will stop sharing and I believe turn it over to Ron and Lynn and Melvin. And I will monitor the chat. So if people have questions, I will um, reach out about that. So um, okay. uh, bluntly stated, Lynn, do you mm -hmm. want to take the yep. first? So, so I get to give sort of the setup and the history. And this was really fun to do. It was a stroll through uh, a lot of files. <laughs> And, uh, and brought back a lot of memories. And so, but I, we thought, I thought it was, we thought it was important to really put this in the context since we really are celebrating an anniversary of this. And it really began back in, uh, I think 2004, 2005, when the Carolina Center for Public Service did some visioning and strategic planning and was realizing we had lots and lots of student programs, but we said, and we said we supported faculty, but we had very few structured ways to support faculty. So we wanted to increase ways that the center supported Carolina faculty and encouraged scholarly efforts around engagement. Um, our associate director at that time, Amy Gorley, happened to attend the, an outreach and engagement conference, which is now known as the Community Engagement Consortium, which is a great, by the way, a great meeting to go to every year. Uh, but she learned about a program at the University of New Hampshire called Outreach Scholars Academy and came back and we said, oh, this sounds really neat. Well, many of you may know Adam Goldstein, who is a physician in family practice, and Adam was on our board at the time. And Adam said, you know, I have a semester of leave coming up and I'd love to do some exploring of different programs and maybe come up with some ideas. So he did that. And I actually wrote Adam yesterday and said, oh, can you join us? And so, unfortunately, he's going to Florida to a funeral, but I'm glad we're recording it because I want to share with it. He said it really was a meaningful um, task that he took. So I know he'll be excited to see where it's come in 15 years. But um, so in October of 2006, convened a steering committee. I'm going to read their names because I think it's worth it. It was chaired by Tom James, who was dean of the School of Government. The members of the committee were Steve Allred, Jeannie Ng, Adam Goldstein, Jack Richmond, Mike Smith, Ron Strauss, Carol Tresselini, Holden Thorpe, Gordon Whitaker, Rachel Willis, and um, then CP CCPS staff, um, Amy Gorley and, and myself. So using that research that Adam had developed, uh, the steering committee developed an initial prospectus and we said, well, we really need feedback on this. So let's have a campus-wide faculty retreat to discuss it. And it was also at this time that you all might remember there was one brief about two year period where we had a vice chancellor for public service and engagement. And that was Mike Smith who did it half time. And so Mike was at that time vice chancellor um, and he talked to Bill Friday and we had a plenary session where Mike interviewed Bill Friday about engagement and engaged scholarship. I would give anything if we could take that. We didn't, but anyway, and then several perspectives, several faculty members with their partners talked about their experiences, and then Mike gave an overview of engaged scholarship, and we then broke out into these very structured with specific questions and timing to be asked for an hour and a half, and there were almost 100 faculty attending this retreat, so we got a lot of good and very opinionated opinions <laughs> about the program, not always the same, but uh, that gave us enough that we came back and, and really worked to develop the program. But I'll say another thing that happened, this is one of those unintended consequences of things. At one point we said to some of the faculty, well, what else can we do to support you? And several people said, if you just kept having meetings like this, it would be great. 
And as a result, that became our very first annual dialogue on engagement, which continued and evolved into various names, but we uh, still have done, I guess the most recent one was the Engage Transform. What is it? Engage? Connect, engage, transform, Connect, engage, transform, rural community so. partnership. And frankly, engagement week. So this it's only appropriate that we be here. But um, we used an initial definition of engaged scholarship as scholarship that is fully grounded as disciplined inquiry according to the highest academic standards that also strengthens university community relationships and contributes to the common good. One of the main things we wanted to get across was that engagement was great. Public service was great, but we were talking about that in combination with scholarship. And so that's what we really wanted to focus the program on. And we adjusted some of, and we could talk about some of the specifics, but they're not really important. Some of the specifics of what we decided to implement and started the program uh, that spring of, 2000, of 2007. One major thing, we did start out thinking it'd be great to have a new cohort every year, so we'd be running two cohorts. <laughs> well, that lasted about a year, right, or two, Ms. Webb, you remember? Anyway, we were all going crazy between what it cost for the stipends, and I will just tell you, if I had to say what is the hardest thing about this program, I would say scheduling <laughs> and finding time that people can do it, and when we did it times two, it just was taking too much, so we we moved to the model we now have. And since then, 63 faculty members have been selected from 10 professional schools and the college, and they've represent, and they re have represented more than 25 departments. Um, now, I think one of the best decisions we made uh, early on was that key to the success of this was that we needed to have consistent faculty and community voices throughout. We knew we'd be getting different ones as we went around and, and learned about different things, but we thought we need somebody that's part of this, experiencing it with us from the fa faculty and the community to help. And so I asked, so we decided that we would have a community course director and a faculty course director. Ron Strauss has served as that faculty course director since the beginning, and we've had two community course directors, uh, Lucille Webb and Melvin Jackson. And I just, when we first began and decided to do this, I knew who was gonna be the perfect inaugural community <laughs> course director, because I'd already learned so much from her over the years. And, but I also knew she was really busy. Um, she was quite in a lot of demand. She gained a national reputation with a lot of her work with Jeannie Ng. But I'm happy to say that Mrs. Lucille Webb, founder of Strengthening the Black Family of Raleigh, agreed to serve in that role. And then happy that one of her protégés, Melvin Jackson, has followed her in that role. Um, I'm extremely thrilled. I've just had flashes in my mind, Ms. Webb, of different things that I remember about you in this program, but I wonder if you'd be willing to just say a little bit about your experience. Well, this was a great experience for me because I learned so much about myself and I learned about others because it's a learning on both sides. You have to trust is my, one of my guiding principles. I, I, so I trusted the center. And then respect. You may not agree with me, but you can respect me. And then it takes commitment to do this kind of work. Now, I have often said to you all, everybody can't do this because you got to have some patience, you got to have some dedication, and you got to be able to listen. And you know, I used to say, you don't want me to talk back to you. It's not talking. <laughs> It's not talking back. It's just saying what I have a feeling for from you and from me. And so that's my guiding principle. And secondly, you always wanted to know, well, sometimes what does Black people want? Or what's the Black community's needs? It's the, it's the same kind of needs that everybody has. But what is the Black community? Because usually the setup was that we lived in a certain area that we were all there together, 
but we were great. We had institutions, we had churches, we had organizations, we had all of these things. So we were just a little community that by, I guess the legality of it, we were all there together, but we were great. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot to listen to you all. I learned a lot from Melvin because Melvin does his, well, there's a great difference between <laughs> Melvin and my age. Now I can tell you when I was born, you, but my daughter would say, that's not what they ask you for. But, <laughs> 1927. And so that's a good while. So I, I, I'm the sum total of my experiences. And so that's what I brought. And it, it wasn't saying that the university didn't know anything or the university didn't have excellence, but I thought there was something we could learn from each other because you knew a lot that I didn't know. And I thought maybe you might know something from me, but because someone told me from, said, well, you don't, you, you haven't been trained to do that, but I have worked with young people all my life. That's what I was trained to do, whether it was at UNC or whether it was at Cedar Grove Elementary School or whether it was at, with Jeannie Ng or whether it was traveling across wherever or whether it was in, Africa, it, for women, the university for women, just representing to, to be there, to show up other people and to be able to do that. So I just had a great opportunity and being a part of the center and for as long as I could was a great, great contribution to my life and I hope I made a contribution well, you as did. I moved along. Very foundational. You have you have changed the lives of many of the scholars and um and I hate to tell you, you still are current because Melvin and I often invoke your name. <laughs> 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 and and we have the what would Mrs. Webb say, right? We got, what would Mrs. Webb say? But I, I I just have to tell this one because you can tell Mrs. Webb is a teacher. She was a teacher and she is a teacher. And sometimes that was more apparent than others. And there was one time where somebody, and I can't remember the exact circumstances of it, but the scholars were sitting around a table and said, somebody needs to do something about that. And Mrs. Webb pulled herself up and she pointed that finger and she said, why don't you do something about it? And they ended up writing an op-ed and getting it published. <laughs> So anyway. And that um, was in class one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so Melvin, can we, I, 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 I'm, uh -huh. I'm aware of yep. time, so I'm going to keep us moving. Um, Melvin, could you introduce the concept of having a faculty um, split between community and a university person? Um, yes, I can. Uh, real briefly, I will. Um, First of all, I'd like to say that it's an honor to be placed in this position by Ms. Will, because I was placed in this position. I wasn't, I, I didn't volunteer it. I was placed in the position, but I, I mean, I love her well. But uh, as far as having a uh, community course director, uh, there, there's a lot of value in that. And, and, and one of the things that I, I, I didn't have the true concept of, community engagement and community engagement scholarship. So I, I've learned a lot around the scholarship piece of it, but uh, I, I, I sit in this position uh, trying to bring uh, a consistent message around proximity. It's very important that as we bring uh, faculty members into this work and they bring their work into this process, that they are proximate to the communities that they're working in. And one of the issues I always have, especially around this is we talk about engagement, but we're 
really talking about community. And community can mean a lot of things, but that's very important. And, and that proximity means that that brings about relationships. So if we don't have proximity, we're going to have relationships. And I think that's what, as a community person, as a community um, course director, we bring to the table. And that, that generates the involvement in doing this work. And I've done it for over 10 years, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this. Thank you. That was beautiful. And I can't imagine a better partnership. I've learned to listen to Melvin Jackson every time he speaks. It might take me a couple of days to get there, but I <laughs> listen carefully. Um, I, I do want to make a point, and that has to do with power. Um, big institutions easily can feel empowered to do as they wish in communities and push people around. And part of what I've so impressed with in the faculty engaged scholarly realm is the degree to which power is shared right from the start. And it has to be. And it has to be a, an agreement that there will be, as Mrs. Webb has said, a place at the table for people who have knowledge, unique knowledge of the life and values of a community. And, and uh, another colleague of mine said about that place at the table, uh, he said, if you're not at the table, believe me, you're on the menu. And I've often thought about that. And the sense of inclusion really matters. And so today we actually invited four of our scholars um, to speak a little bit with you about their own experience as a scholar and the project that they took on and whether that had led to some recognition and really how that fits into their trajectory as a scholar. And um, I think that the gaze needs to be on them. And so what I'm going to do is actually ask one at a time for you to just talk about um, that experience. Uh, being careful, let's say that we don't run lo longer than five to seven minutes for each so that we've got time for everybody to speak. And how about we start with Cheryl, Cheryl Giscombe from the School of Nursing. Cheryl, you want to take it? Yes, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's, it's definitely, um, this was life-changing, not just career-changing, but life-changing, and it really did um, most definitely influenced my career. I'm Cheryl Giscombe. I'm currently the Associate Dean for the PhD program and division in the School of Nursing. I'm a distinguished um, professor of um, health promotion, quality of life, and wellness. Um, much of my achievements have been, many of them have been um, due to my ability to not keep my love and passion for the community on the fringes because of this program. So, you know, either we do it, or, you know, if we do it often, we do it in the background on our time off or, you know, we quiet about it. That's how it was in academia. I think prior to programs such as this, um, because we have our other benchmarks if you're on the tenure track, um, but this validated my passion for integrating my clinical work as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, my PhD education as a social and health psychologist and my lifelong upbringing of being of service to the community. I'm from North Carolina. I'm born here in Chapel Hill from Person County, raised in Person County. My father's from Charlotte. My mother's from Warren County near Lake Gaston. So I am deeply committed to North Carolina. And so this program um, I think runs through my veins. And so I was, um, it's a, a, a true privilege to have been an academic, um, a faculty member, as this program continued to develop where community engagement was able to be part of consideration of promotion and tenure. So I was a Thorpe faculty engaged scholar from 2014 to 2016. I received tenure in 2015 as a, an associate professor. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I moved into um, becoming a, a, a Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation Macy faculty scholar after and really in, during my last year as a Thorpe faculty engaged scholar. Um, I, my community partner was Healing with Care in Durham, North Carolina, um, and the, the director and founder of Healing with Care, Dr. Sharon Elliott Bynum. We already had an existing relationship, um, but this allowed me to continue that without being on the fringes. 
it allowed me to really integrate it into my work as a faculty member. I continued to have clinical place. It was a clinical placement site for undergraduate and graduate students. I uh, mentored researchers at the site. Um, I also mentored students that weren't UNC students, but who came to the site from other schools. Um, Sharon, Dr. Bynum and I um, applied for um, tracks funding and we got it. We had pilot funding from Dr. Giselle Corby Smith Center for Health Equity Research. Um, and eventually the work that I did there led to HRSA work. As I mentioned, the Macy Faculty Scholars work, as well as my current NIH R01 grant, which is um, when you can, can you uh, conclude directs and indirects, it's 3.1, about 3.1 billion, not billion, one day, <laughs> 3.1 million dollars in funding from NIH, from the um, International Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And so the work that I did as a Thorpe Falcon Engage Scholar was preliminary foundational work um, to get the community voices input on previous work I had done to then inform um, the development of a a randomized control trial study. So I do research on stress and coping in the community um, and I use mindfulness-based interventions and we've culturally tailored that. And so the work that I did as a Thorpe faculty engaged scholar, um, you know, really did support that. In addition, my Macy work was focused on developing the Interprofessional Leadership Institute for Behavioral Health Equity where I formalized the training that I was doing with students clinically and research at CARE. Um, and so that led to all these things led to publications, grants, eventually my promotion to full professor. Last year I was promoted to full professor, um, continued to, to develop and, and do this work. So now I'm on the double AMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges um, Arts and Humanities Initiative. I'm a committee member and now we're piloting work to, we're trying to integrate arts and humanities and community engagement in medical education. I do similar work with nursing. I just finished my tenure literally on Saturday as president of the International Society for Psychiatric Nurses, which if I hadn't been able to continue my clinical work as a tenure track faculty, I would not be an experienced psychiatric nurse practitioner to have the ability to be a president of such an organization. I could go on and on. Um, but I know there I need to leave time for my colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, people may know that Dr. Sharon Elliott Bynum passed away. Um, CARE is currently searching for an executive director. I'm not about to apply to that position, <laughs> but it is still a huge passion of mine um, to support that organization. If there were two of me, I would apply for such a position. I, my vision would be that UNC would really have more connections with organizations like that because they need help, but we also need help. So I wish there was a graduate Thorpe faculty engaged scholars program that would help me figure out how to do that um, because it would be a loss for us not to continue to educate students at that place as well as support the mission of that organization. Um, I'll stop there and I just wanna say thank you so much that one of the biggest treasures was meeting some, so many of you. Rhonda Hubbard's not here, but she's become a dear friend. And I met her through the Faculty Engaged Scholars Program as well. So I just wanna say thank you. So um, just to flush this out a little bit, one of the things that's so notable about this, this isn't like taking a course. This is like a group seminar on the move. We move to different places in communities. We get to know communities through the eyes of our um, faculty. And so much of what we do, we actually do on a bus, on a van, where we get a chance to talk about who and what we've seen. So I'm going to move us to another scholar. Um, let's go across the campus to Ted Zoller from Keenan Flagler Business School. Ted. Thanks, Ron. I, you know, I got to tell you, the, the, the Thorpe Engage Scholar Program was a game changer for me in so many ways. You know, I think that uh, Lynn and Ron took a little bit of a winger uh, on me when I uh, applied for it because he, who's this guy over the business school who wants to do public service? And uh, honestly, I believe that engaged scholarship is the highest form of scholarship because if your scholarship is not used in the community, it's completely meaningless. Um, of course, my basic scientist friends will probably quarrel with me, but I honestly think this is the highest form of scholarship. And as um, a faculty member at the University of North Carolina, 
It's uh, one of the three uh, bedrock principles of our university is our service to the people of North Carolina. So, you know, the program really animated that value for me in a really meaningful way. Um, it exposed me to issues that were, uh, you know, I got to admit to you, you know, sometimes in a higher education type of setting, you are in a little bit of a bubble. You know, the ivory tower does exist to a certain extent. And it exposed me to some of the key issues uh, on the ground. The project that I put forward was really kind of a novel idea in the day. And it's actually um, changed the trajectory of my life uh, in so many ways. It's extraordinary. But it hadn't it been for the uh, Thorpe and Gage College program, I'm not sure I would have ever gotten there. Because that support and that acknowledgement and that encouragement was enough to kind of put me out there and uh, get me moving. Um, so I'd encourage those of you who are thinking, you know, this is a project I would like to do, but I don't have the white space to do it. It's a great way to signal to your leadership, your administration, the deans, uh, your, your, your faculty chairs, uh, the importance of the work that you're doing. Um, so I'd encourage everyone uh, who is applying to really see uh, this as a vehicle to have a dialogue uh, with your academic leadership on um, uh, the importance of engagement. Um, my particular project was uh, based on some research I had done on social network uh, theory around uh, the formation of entrepreneurial ecosystems. And that sounds like a lot of words, but basically networks of people who start businesses. Why is that relevant to community? It's uh, about rendering uh, opportunity available. It's about realizing the potential of a community by trying to find opportunity and making sure opportunity is open to everyone. Uh, at the time, Research Triangle uh, was underperforming other regions uh, in relation to its entrepreneurial potential. A lot of us talk about Research Triangle being a hot spot or what have you, but we were actually lagging regions that were uh, similar to ours. And uh, we were able, based on the work that um, I did through the scholars program, uh, go to the Blackstone Foundation, who uh, funded a very novel three-year initiative called the Blackstone Entrepreneurs Network. Basically, what we did is we went to existing entrepreneurs on the ground, and uh, as they were successful, we asked them to stick with the region. So we gave them a badge, and we said, go out and find the next generation of entrepreneurs, go nurture them, and go bring them to the next level. So your job isn't to go um, to the beach or to the golf course or whatever you would do when you have a liquidity event, but your job is to serve. And uh, it worked out amazingly. Um, that one intervention led to uh, the appointment of not only um, a network here in Research Triangle, but we actually stimulated uh, that work all over the state. And uh, I was pleased to see how it kind of transferred. And we did a similar pro program in uh, Denver uh, and Boulder, Colorado. And they're both thriving to this day, these networks. What's fascinating is the network then evolved to a recognition that there wasn't enough early stage funding for nascent entrepreneurs. And uh, what was born out of that uh, realization uh, was um, that uh, we needed angel funds. And uh, the Carolina Angel Network now exists, the Duke Angel Network now exists, the Wolfpack Innovation uh, Fund uh, exists, and NC Central also formed uh, an angel fund. And while that might sound like uh, just universities doing what universities do, it's exactly what universities do not do, is fund entrepreneurship. And we did it through their alumni, very novel um, business model. The alumni would engage with the, the young generation of entrepreneurs with the idea of moving them forward. Um, this work has been done now all over the world. I'm taking my students, uh, for instance, in May uh, to Iceland. You might wonder why Iceland? Iceland is a sovereign uh, country in the middle of the North Atlantic in a frozen island of 400,000 people, even smaller than North Carolina. Well, back around the time of the Thorpe and Gage Scholars Program, I did a, 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 a project there to show what the status of their entrepreneurial ecosystem is. I'm taking my students back now 10 years later to show how it's evolved. And now it's one of the most vibrant entrepreneurial hotspots. So not only did we do good in North Carolina, in, in Colorado, I've actually done this work all over the world and we've stimulated uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems in Eastern Europe, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, 
uh, throughout Atlanta, Canada, uh, Western Canada, and throughout the United States in over 32 different communities. So I credit the Thorpe Engage College Program for really putting the raison d'etre to my research on the ground and to also give me um, a really strong uh, amount of encouragement to make sure that we are doing good the entire time. Um, honestly, I think that the, uh, now RTP is a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. And uh, I think a big part of it had to do with that, that Blackstone experiment. So I'm really thrilled uh, with the outcomes. So I'd encourage anyone who's serious about seeing their work translated and specifically having impact on the community uh, to engage in the program. Um, I, I, it was one of the most meaningful experiences in my life. I'm so proud. One of the things that uh, Ron and Lynn and other, others who are involved with the program uh, do at the graduation is they give you a graduation cord. And uh, that's the one I'm most proud of um, <laughs> when I wear it uh, in my regalia. And I just want to thank everyone involved in the program, but particularly Ron and Lynn for having taken a chance with a, a, a business professor. Well, thank you, Ted. Um, you know, Ted is opening the possibility that we um, reach um, engagement both on a local and domestic scale, but also on an international and global scale. And I'd like to bring Rachel Willis in because I think Rachel might be able to help us flesh that out. It's also important to hear from the College of Arts and Sciences and Rachel coming in from American Studies here perfect for that role. So would you take it away, please? Absolutely. I'm going to talk really fast. And if I, I've set my timer here for five minutes, if I make it in five minutes, could I share the screen with our product? Sure. Not a lot of people have product. All right. Um, as Lynn graciously said, I was on that committee I, since the 90s. I've been working on getting for a center for public service with um, not just Mike Smith and Ron Strauss, but um, the late Judith Wagner, who's Dean of the Law School, uh, trying to work in parallel with the Apples program, the Student Service Learning Program, which I was at from the very beginning in 1990. Um, it's always been my mode of operandi, but I design, helped the center design this program and many other programs that are at the center, like the undergraduate programs, and so for years, I was sentenced to participating in the faculty selection for five cycles. Um, and it was awful because you guys were going to get all these great experiences. And here I was uh, not having been trained to do this, but uh, I went along for about five years and I frequently participated in their field studies, their trainings, if they had open lectures or events. And I always went and took pictures at graduation. Um, as I transitioned in my own research from working on manufacturing workers to global freight, freight transportation competitiveness, uh, it sounds like a weird thing. I studied stocks, how do stocks get to global markets? Um, I took an incredibly serendipitous trip to Panama, summer 2013, July to be specific. And we had a horrific flood here in Chapel Hill that flooded my yard uh, five inches in 14 hours and put a pine tree over the bridge from my driveway to my house. Uh, and I was trying to get pity from everybody and texting pictures in my family. Everybody was somewhere else in the world. And I said, water over the bridge, water over the bridge. And it crystallized some of the things that I was working on and why I was going to the Panama Canal. Global infrastructure was changing and America was not keeping up. Um, I went there as a documentary for photographer with the young, this is the important part, the young waterway infrastructure engineers of the world. So these are people that build canals and bridges and flood projects. And it was the biggest project at that time, $5 billion to expand the canal. And they were in the middle of construction. And from the first morning, all those young people, they didn't care about old school canal stuff. They wanted to know, was this being built because the previous canal, still in operation, 100 years old, was this being built to withstand the challenges of climate change? Not just rising sea levels, but severe precipitation, severe drought, which weakens canals. Um, I came back just crazy about this, and I did a major research pivot to focus my entire engaged scholarship and teaching agenda 
to address climate change and the vulnerable coastal communities and global ports. I don't know if Ram remembers it, but I got we met for coffee or something and he asked what I was doing. We, he gave me the most perfectly timed advice ever in my whole career. He said, go talk to Peter Koklanis at the Global Research Institute. That's who you should be talking to if you're gonna study this. Peter had me apply for a leave over there. I also had a semester of Chapman family faculty leave. So basically I went back to graduate school for a year uh, over there living at the FedEx Center on the fourth floor of the Global Education Center. I got to stay for a couple of years, become a senior faculty fellow. And the most important part was engaging interdisciplinary in real ways with many people in public health, environmental engineering, planning, and so many other places on campus and off campus. And they led to extraordinary global travel opportunities, both for the organization that I went to Panama with and the scholars at the center. Um, and there were postdocs from different countries. It was an amazing, vi vibrant place. Uh, one of the most important is that I went to the IPC's last scientific conference before the Paris Accords. Um, then I came back, I said, man, I need this. I asked if I could apply for the program and I was accepted into class six, no longer on selection. I was happy as a clam and learned um, from 2016 to 2018 and beyond through continuing seminars. Um, I was working on this manuscript water over the bridge, but being at the center, the Center for Public Service and being with these scholars from so many different fields, especially public health, I started to get a broader perspective on who could be a community partner. And fortuitously due to the pandemic and our inability to be out in the community, um, not very many people are gonna say that, I partnered with campus partners and in particular Apples and most importantly, the Beam, be a maker. Um, we designed, from the Paris conference, I learned there's lots of ways to communicate with people and not many people were communicating with young people. My hero was Greta. I wanted to reach young people. We had four semesters, five now, of game development. And we built a game called Climatopia. And it's beautiful. Um, we used a lot of things at the Beam Lab. We've given professional conferences at the federal CISA RISA conference on coastal resilience in the Carolinas. I presented for Homeland Security lots of places. That's my five minute mark. We have six disasters, hurricanes, the birth of the Public Service Center, everybody knows. Uh, also flooding, inland flooding has turned into a terrible situation. Waterborne, uh, water precipitation, snow and ice, waterborne diseases, of course, lack of water, droughts and wildfire. So for the last two years since I got the fellowship were spent developing this game. We won third place in interdisciplinary projects at the first Beam Maker Fest, and we'll be appearing again with cooler stuff and more recycled products. Um, and fall 22, I'm very, very honored to receive a research sabbatical to write about the lessons we learned from COVID, which are about global cooperation on global problems, to what's gonna take for us to get our acts together globally to act on climate change and reducing um, particles in the air and increasing the warming of the parents. Um, I just wanna share uh, just a couple pictures. Can I share a screen? Is that okay? Um, yep. Oops, there we go. Screen one. Okay, so this is the PowerPoint from the Carolinas Climate Resilience Conference. And we made a resource backpack where you can put cell phone charges and various things in it. The game board is fabric as well. And these are our darling little 3D uh, parts. Uh, this was done by undergraduates to find engaging ways to teach about climate change challenges. And we partnered with different people over the years and presented at different places, uh, starting in 2018 when I you know, was finishing up the uh, thing, just very different things, but it's been highly successful and we hope to be presenting it, keeping history above water pretty soon, another national conference in another field. Um, the coolest partner we have is Spoonflower here in Durham, which custom prints fabric. And so we can make this game. People can order exactly one yard of fabric. 
and they will get all of the pieces to sew the game and they can decide they could use hard cheesy pieces or milk caps of different colors, but they can play the game. We have a lovely website um, to explain how to play the game. Hang on just a second. Um, this is our Climatopia website. Some of our play things designed in the 3D lab are amazing. This is our utility truck. It's both a snowplow and a cherry picker to restore utilities. Students from the art department have done extraordinary graphics. Uh, our water raft rescue, our first aid kit, our science. Um, oh, we also do severe heat, I forgot, which I want to say severe heat. 80% of all Americans lived in a county that had severe heat this past summer, extreme heat. And so we examined that. That's our wildfires and our FEMA flashlight. But it's pretty extraordinary what they've done. Um, I'm beyond proud of them. We'll be presenting again at the undergraduate research celebration and at the Beam Festival and the game development has really taught them how to share with kids, how to build resilient communities in a resilient way. And we are Great. now gonna do wood pieces. That's it, I'm out. Wonderful, thank you, Rachel. Um, so Rachel started us um, thinking about sort of the convergence between um, art and community engagement. And there's nobody of our scholars better equipped to address that than Mimi Chapman. And I just wanna share with you, uh, she mentioned um, how the makerspace can do things. This is one of our faculty who, who gave me his production of um, the, the bean. Who knows what's next? Um, Mimi, can you take it please? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, so let's see. I'm looking at the clock, so I won't go over. Um, so I think I was in the first class of um, Thorpe Engaged Scholars. So we were all, I think, learning together in some ways. And I started that in that class at the same point that I was starting a project that was funded by Robert Wood Johnson, which was referred to as Creating Confianza. And it was um, aimed at new immigrant communities. It, it was a, we had 15 sister projects around the country. And um, the project was based in Chatham County in the Chatham County Schools. And we were partnering with um, El Futuro um, in Durham that, well, it was at that time, it was in Carborough. Their main offices were in Carborough um, and they were extending their services out. So, um, it, so what, the scholars, the scholars gave me so many things. Um, and so, uh, and kind of roughly in two different categories, it became sort of a lab and a therapy group really, where I could bring these experiences that I was having at, uh, you know, trying to lead the, the, in this space of power and privilege and how they were coming into play. Um, and also the reality that when you talk about dealing with a community, you're often talking about dealing with different communities. And so really de deciding who, who is the community of focus at any given time, what communities are getting in your way. Um, and um, Because we had that, we had um, a situation in the schools at that time where we did not, you know, where the, the professional group within the schools, they were not necessarily, um, they weren't stopping us from doing this work, but they weren't helping us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was a lot of ambivalence in, in whether they wanted this work to go on in their schools and how. And so that became a big topic of discussion. And I think um, thinking about Mrs. Webb, it's so wonderful to see you and to remember just so, so much of what I learned from you. Um, at that point in, in where Carolina was, I think we were at a very different point in talking about the racial history of this campus. Um, you know, it was not a this was not the conversation um, in all corners of campus that it is now. And so, but within the scholars program, that was a point at which, you know, I really began to understand these historical legacies and what they meant to work today in a way that I didn't know before. Um, and, and that was a great gift um, to me in, in all aspects of my 
work and life as a faculty member, um, really. So I'm, I'm very grateful and thankful for that. Um, what grew out of you know, this work, which is what Ron is referencing, I think is the, is as we moved into how are, you know, the, the school systems in which we were working were, this work was not, was gonna be on the periphery. It was not gonna be central unless the entire system began to change. And we had to think about how we were gonna affect that. Um, and, you know, typically the ways that that is affected are things that we think of as diversity trainings or racial equity trainings or whatever they might be. Um, and those, the, those traditional methods were not working. And um, what we took a trip to the Ackland as a, um, as a class. And the Ackland at that time was, um, had an exhibit going on called Photographing, Photographing the World, Picturing the World. I think it was Picturing the World. And in it, um, I saw photographs by one of our Carolina graduates um, from the photojournalism program, um, Janet Jarman. And Janet had um, begun following a young girl who she met in Mexico. And she followed um, Marisol and her, uh, her family on their migration journey. And she is in touch with Marisol to this day. And so those pictures became um, a centerpiece of our work. Um, and that project was called Yoveo. And we began working with teachers. And then also we extended that out. The NIH um, and the National Endowment for the Arts supported us um, in a grant that allowed us to take that into um, into medical providers and looking at how we used images to um, help people unpack their own attitudes and see if we could target both explicit and implicit bias toward particular communities. And so, um, it, you know, very formative, of course, in my current roles, I'm not doing as much research um, as I have done in the past, but it is a, a place that I deeply value and want to, I'm looking forward to going back to when I'm no longer faculty chair. So, um, but so that was, and then, then the third bucket, I think Rachel referenced in some ways was just the community of people that you get exposure to and enter into with this group, like understanding the whole history of this campus and understanding the importance of a public institution and that mission. Um, and how important it is. And that has certainly, so I think the whole program really embedded me in that perspective um, in a different way. So I'll stop there. Wonderful, this is just great. Um, I, I do wanna reflect that um, one of the uncertainties when we began this program was, was there a pathway to tenure and promotion for faculty members that shows this as their direction? And, and it, isn't, it isn't a certainty, it wasn't a certainty. It actually took uh, Lynn Blanchard and a panel of faculty to work on new criteria for promotion and tenure at UNC to make that happen. But I am actually proud that, and it wasn't a deliberate effort, but all four of the people that we asked to speak on this panel are tenured and promoted to full professor at UNC with a criteria that years ago were not um, certain at all. So I wanna credit and reflect on uh, Lynn's leadership in making that happen. And in every step of the way, uh, she has been here to um, both lift up this concept, but also to provide the details to make it come alive. Um, but the other thing I want to say is that the depth of relationship between community organizations and community members and faculty has remained a, a vital piece of scholarship at Carolina. And I see that reflected in big choices all over the campus. And literally, I believe that it is leaders like Lucille Webb and Melvin Jackson and, and others, because there are many others, um, who created that 
not only the seat at the table, they actually created the table. And they allowed us to find a way to collaborate and taught us how to do it and continue to do that. Um, but it is that essential collaboration that is foundational to this program. And so I, I just want to remind you that one of the singular most important things is that when you're looking as a faculty member for where you're gonna devote your energy next, that you engage with your partners, you find partners if you don't have them, and you listen to those partners so that when you're finished, you have products that matter to the people who in the community and in our state. Otherwise, we can, you know, as, as academics, we can get into silos and do our own work and never really wonder what's going to happen to that work. And sometimes that work is not turned out to help communities. It even can turn out sometimes to damage communities. But the foundational principle here is before you write your grants, before you start sketching out your project, is making sure that your partners are with you and support you and that you're listening in a regular way. And then as your project goes along and you have to figure out, well, what do I do with this research? Make sure that the products of that uh, research are accessible to people and of value to the community. That's the foundation for engaged scholarship. So I, I know that we're five minutes from the end of this. There's not a lot of room for discussion here, but I just wanted to see if, if anybody either had something they wanted to say to amplify on this, or if any of the other attendees had questions they wanted to pose. So I'll stop. Ron, if I could volunteer, one thing that I will say is the biggest takeaway from the experience is the mindset um, that I think it's permanently changed the way I look at my scholarship. Um, I'm right now in the process of writing a book called Gumption, which is about everyday entrepreneurs uh, that think of it as the entrepreneur next door. And it, the, my whole lens toward this work has been uh, a function of um, the work that we did when we were in the in the, in the engaged college program. So I just want to thank you for uh, giving us the ability to do it, number one. And, it, you know, you can count on us to also be uh, helpful when when and if you ever want to expand the program, because, uh, you know, I think we're all passionate about what you're doing. Right. Thank you. Vicki, you are our mm -hmm. other community engaged scholar who's here. And I wonder if you could just quickly tell us, because if I remember correctly, the very last session, you had sort of hit a place in your research where you really were looking at how to apply it and go next steps. I'd just love to hear a little bit about. <laughs> yeah, so I actually had been involved with two different projects. And the one was this uh, falls prevention program in Western North Carolina called the Community Health and Mobility Partnership. Uh, and that has continued to, to go well up until COVID when we had to suspend operations um, because of that. But um, we, I was able to, with the PhD student that I worked with, um, to get some um, scholarly publications out about the effects of that program and looking at who ben benefited most some of the characteristics of the um, older adults in that program who had the greatest benefits from participation. So, you know, those sorts of things were really helpful. The other project that I was involved with then and, and actually just came back from this weekend, Saturday, is a project in um, Terrell County in Eastern North Carolina. It's a service learning trip and there has been really no engaged scholarship related to that. So um, I, I have some questions actually and thoughts that I'll get with people individually about uh, related to that and some of the challenges that we're facing and in getting into, we have strong community partners there, but we're missing some key people that should be at the table, I think, in that community. And I think there's some resistance. It was interesting, Amy's comments about that um, from certain elements in the community. So I would 
Uh, I'll be in touch about trying right. to navigate some of those challenging aspects of continuing to um, bring everybody to the table. Absolutely. Let's we'll, and maybe we could help get some folks together if you wanted to do something to uh, Rachel, Rachel. Rachel's got her hand up. I want to say the single most valuable session was after I was a scholar. So keep going to them. It was where you had the author of the book about communicating. And we had to in the room with strangers in a pair share do a 30 second elevator pitch. Do you remember this? Yeah. Or one minute, whatever it was. The next week I was invited with everybody on campus that was doing environmental with all the communicators on campus to give a pitch. And I was the only one that kept it within 30 seconds, which is incredibly unlike me. But <laughs> La Alyssa LaFaro picked up on me because I was clear in that 30 seconds. It was exactly what I scripted. And she ended up coming with me for a week to the beach. We went the whole coast of the Carolinas. She wrote incredible stories, took extraordinary photographs for um, endeavors. And she translated it to my department, which is not interested in climate change or STEM fields or economics into the humanities and what it meant. And it was transforming for me to watch her say what I thought I was saying in better ways. And then the second thing is tell everybody what you're working on, total strangers, wherever you meet them. I can't, there must be a hundred conversations of connections that were extraordinarily valuable because I had that 30 second pitch, but keep going to the sessions. So that was my pitch. Wonderful. And, and I don't want to close today without um, asking our, really our spiritual leader um, to say a couple of words. So last word, Mrs. Webb, would you take <laughs> us somewhere? Listening to all this and knowing 63 faculty members have passed through this portal. Any thoughts? Well, I, I think for me, we've all lived up to what I call those guiding principles of listening, just being respectful, being committed, and just taking the time to do the work. And we can learn from everybody. I may not make my cake like you do, but it's still good. You make your cake another way. It's still good. But we are all together in this. And I think that's the, that's a perfect way. And as somebody wrote, Aaron wrote, yes to cake. Let's <laughs> have our cake and eat it too. Thank you all. This was <laughs> wonderful. Thanks for being here. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you, you all for taking the time. Yeah.